We're going to talk about the book of Matthew today. The book of Matthew comes first. I think we might ask ourselves, why does it come first in the Gospels? And uh, there's not one answer for that. It may be that the, the book of Matthew sort of contains more of what we would consider the gospel of Jesus Christ than almost any other of the documents. When we think what's there, the Sermon on the Mount, um, a lot of details about Jesus' life, a lot of details about John the Baptist, about his birth, uh, and, and a very comprehensive uh, treatment of the uh, atonement. But before we get to that, um, I'm going to mention what I probably have never noticed about the book of Matthew. I don't really notice the Mount of Transfiguration because I don't really get it. Um, it doesn't strike me the way certain other things in the scriptures do, but uh, several of our commentaries, and this one in particular that I love. If you don't have this big coffee table book, buy it for yourself for Christmas. Jesus Christ in the World of the New Testament. It's by that guy whose name we can't say. Richard Holtzapfel and Eric Huntsman and Thomas Wayman, and they are scholars at BYU. I have found both these books, the one on the Old Testament and the one on the New Testament, to be the best references I have on the scriptures, and it's partly because there's really a lot of cool pictures, and they, and they divide things up so that they tell you little facts about things, and then they'll show you, for example, this is a, a stele, you know, a stone on which things are carved, and it warns people not to touch the tombs of the dead, and it's, it's from a time right after Jesus' death, and because, uh, you know, scholars say that the, this seems to indicate this is, was put up in A.D. 41 through 54 by a, a ruler named Claudius, and it seems to indicate that the big uproar over Jesus' death and whether or not he was actually resurrected is making the rulers trying to be careful that nobody else seems to disappear from a tomb. And uh, there's so many interesting things like that, uh, pictures of fragments of the book of Matthew, of which there are about 5,000 fragments uh, that have been found. So more fragments of the book of Matthew have been found than any other of the Gospels. And that's another reason why scholars uh, tend to um, spend a lot of time uh, with it, because there really are some things to study. On the Mount of Transfiguration, which happens in Matthew 17, um, I'm going to start with it and end with it. A little Mark and Sandwich for you. So let's go to Matthew 17. In Matthew 16, Jesus uh, has some conversations, uh, some famous conversations with the apostle, one that is very familiar with us, where he says, um, where he says to the apostles, because everybody's upset and leaving him, and he says um, in verse 13, when Jesus, and I'm in 1613, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say that thou art Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, but whom say you that I am? And of course, this is the most important question that could be asked of us in our lives. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, the man who will jump out of the boat, is the first one to speak up. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And so this testimony of Christ that they have is the building block for coming into the 17th chapter of Matthew, which is described as the climax of this book. A lot of times we, you know, you get to a climax of a story. That's a literary thing. We get to a climax of a story where all of the action comes together. Why would this be the climax of that book? And have you had in your life a Mount of Transfiguration moment? I want you to write that in your notebook or in the margin of the scripture. Have I had a Mount of Transfiguration moment? Where was my Mount of Transfiguration? If I haven't had one, why haven't I had one? After six days in chapter 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. So he's taken how many people with him? Three, his closest disciples. And um, 
and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. And then answered Peter, who has no idea what to say, Lord, it's good for us to be there. Shall I make some altars for everyone? Um, but while Peter's kind of trying to you know, make sense of this situation, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces, more sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So I'm just going to leave that in your minds and have you think about why did this happen? Why was it important? What happened that was significant there? And in order to get to Matthew 17, let's start with Matthew, who takes the whole book, as these marvelously constructed books are. They're just absolute works of art, works of inspiration, works of genius, unbelievable. And Matthew, now that you've all been inspired by my tax man jokes. Yeah, cracking us up. These are the clean ones. Um, <laughs> I have filtered the others for you. <laughs> People get very excited about the tax man. They really say some mean things. Um, three things I'd like to just talk about in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew begins and ends with um, this phrase, God with us. And um, we'll talk about why five is a magic number in Matthew, and then we'll, we'll get to our Mount of Transfiguration again. Don't worry, we're going to come back up it. First and last, Matthew begins with God with us. Let's open the book of Matthew and look at the first chapter. And in order to look at the first chapter, I'd like my four genealogy people to come forward. Matthew begins with the genealogy. Luke saves his genealogy for the third chapter. The genealogies are different. If you have genealogy, if, you have, if you're one of the other women, please come forward. Because I'm just going to have each one of you take a minute and explain who your other woman is. The, the genealogy of Matthew and the genealogy of Luke are different. And the thing that's different about the one in Matthew, besides the fact that there's a few um, people that are different, is that he mentions four women. And, you know, women so rarely get mentioned in the scriptures that we need to make a big fuss about it when they do. And if Matthew mentions women in the genealogy of Jesus, there's a reason. One of the things that is commonly said about Matthew, and if somebody asked me, you know, even a few weeks ago, okay, what's different about Matthew than the other Gospels? I would say, well, Matthew's the one that's really talking to the Jews because he's always talking about prophecies that get fulfilled. And in fact, there are about a dozen places where he says, and this happened so that it might be fulfilled that was said this. And so he definitely is doing that. He is, he is always referring back in a ritualistic way almost to the Torah and the things that have been prophesied. Remember that these scriptures were disseminated orally mostly. Mo most people couldn't read and they were read in the synagogue and then after there became Jewish Christians, they were read in the gatherings of Jewish Christians and they were recorded and written in such a way that, that, that there were repetitions in them so that they were easier to remember. If you look at the genealogy of Jesus, um, in the book of Matthew, in the very first chapter, there are four women who are mentioned. And I'm going to have our four other women tell us who these women are. OK, I was asked to review Genesis 38 and tell us about Tamar. Raise your hand if you know who Tamar was. OK, let me tell you, Judah had three sons, Er, Onan, and Shulah. Er, the first son, had a wife named Tamar, but that first son died because he wasn't obedient. He was a wicked son. So the father, Judah, told Tamar, his daughter-in-law, excuse me, wait, 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 wait. Okay, Judah went to his son, Onan, and said, go to Tamar and conceive from her so that thy brother's seed can stay in the family. And uh, he didn't want to do that. So he went into Tamar, but 
Um, it says, uh, and Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass that when he went into his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother, and that did not please the Lord. So he was taken too. But then in the process, Judah told Tamar, wait, just wait. My young son, who has not grown yet, if you can just wait, you'll be able to be with him when he is older. So she went about her way. And then uh, Sheila was older, but she found that things weren't happening as uh, Judah had promised. So she disguised herself. She had found out that Judah was going to go and, and get some sheep. So she disguised herself, put a veil over her, and Judah saw her, and not knowing that it was her daughter-in-law, asked to uh, go into the tent with her. I gave you a good one. I know, I'm going. <laughs> So um, he, not knowing this, she tricked him. And she said, well, what will you give me if I let you come in my tent? And he says, oh, I'll give you a sheep. She goes, no, that's not good enough. How about if you give me your rings and your bracelets that are so valuable, and uh, then I will give them back to you? And he goes, OK, OK, OK. Not thinking with his head, of course. So. Uh, she, he goes away, she goes away. Before she leaves the tent, she takes her veil off, which I guess in that day meant you were a harlot. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, <laughs> so she conceives. She has twins. And their names are Ferez and Z Sarah. And Judah decides that he wants this jewelry back, OK? OK, I told this woman that, and she said she would give it back. So they start looking for her, and they can't find her. And they said, there was, where's the harlot? Where's the harlot? Like, why is he announcing, where's the harlot? I don't know. Um, so uh, they said, there's no harlot here, because Tamar had disguised herself before she left the tent. She took it all off. So. Um, Oh, yeah, OK. I'm going to read um, uh, in verse 28, Genesis 28. And it came to, I'm more than a minute, sorry. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one, she's giving birth to these twins. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, this baby came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Sarah. There you That's go. That's good. You have described who they are. She's an exemplary character in the scriptures, OK? <laughs> I have Rahab, the harlot, living in Jericho. She uh, hid the spies of Joshua. And uh, when the city fell, the army of Israel destroyed everything in the city except for Rahab and uh, her household. And so the scripture in uh, Joshua says, Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy on Jericho. Okay, we sense a pattern. Number three. Well, luckily, I have Ruth. She sounds like a much better character than some of your others. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, you'll recall that Elimelech, um, and I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, but anyway, he took his wife, Naomi, and his two sons out of Bethlehem because there was a famine in the land, so they go to Moab. The two sons marry two wives. One of them is Ruth. And then the father dies, the two sons die, and Naomi tells 
her daughter-in-laws, you guys are young, you guys can go back to your homeland and marry, um, you know, remarry or whatever. And the one daughter-in-law does, but Ruth is famous for saying, you know, your God is my God, your people are my people and your God is my God and stays with her mother-in-law. And then the, the, one of the keys they want you to know is that later Naomi has, Boaz marries um, Ruth and they have uh, son Obed, and then Obed is the father of David. So that's kind of the connection for later in history is she's the grandfather of David. Uh, thank you. Last one. Matthew, verse 6, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. So David's out on the top of his palace, wandering around, looks over and sees a woman who is bathing on an adjacent rooftop and says, wow, she's hot. So she's a beautiful woman. And so he sends messengers to find out who she is. And then the messengers come back and say that she is the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And so David sent messengers and said, invite her over to the palace. And so they spent the evening together. She had recently been purified of her monthly period. And so they slept together. And then she sent a message to David at the palace and said, by the way, I'm pregnant. So David decided that he needed to protect himself, Bathsheba, and he asked for Uriah to be brought home from the war. And so he told Uriah to you know, go home, and he thought he'd spend the night with his wife, but instead he sent the night with the palace guards. And the next morning, David asked, why didn't you go home? Why don't you want to be with your wife? And he said, I could never do that while all of my brothers in the army are there fighting at the battlefront. I can't do that. So then the, that evening, David brought him to the palace, got him drunk, and thought that by doing that, oh, go home, go sleep with your wife. And yet again, he slept at the palace gates and would not go home to his wife. And then there was lots more trouble after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. Um, what, okay, so why did Matthew put these women in here? He didn't need to, you know, he could spin it. He could just talk about the fathers of, just like Luke does. He just talks about the fathers of the children. Why is Rahab the harlot, Tamar the Jewish woman who disguises herself as a harlot and gets her father-in-law to sleep with her, Ruth who is a Moabitess, so that means she is not anywhere connected to the children of Israel, and um, I don't want to shock you, but when Ruth goes in and lays at the feet of of Boaz, that is a euphemism. And then the third, and then the fourth one of all is um, Bathsheba, who, whatever her culpability in this situation, she is both a foreigner and uh, her son, her first child dies, but then she has another child with David, and that is Solomon. But this is the product of an adulterous union for which a murder was committed. Why would Matthew put those people in his genealogy? Anybody? It couldn't be an accident, right? If you were Matthew, why would you have done this? Yeah, say it. Whatever you're thinking. I want to hear it. What? Okay, that might be an answer. Maybe he doesn't like women. Maybe he wants to show the worst side of women. That could be a reason. What might be another reason? Amy. I think it's for the same reason that Jesus Karen? was born in a stable, in a manger. I think that it's to show that Jesus came from these very low, humble origins, and so he's the savior over everybody. Whether you're rich or poor, no matter what sin you've committed, he is your savior. And nothing shows that more than being born of an ancestry of harlots. 
Yeah, you know how, you know, some people's ancestors came over on the Mayflower and some people's ancestors were horse thieves, right? And you do your genealogy and you think, I'm going to find all these great things, and instead you find, you know, everybody was bipolar or something, and you think, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is where I'm coming from, you know? Um, uh, yeah, I think that that is um, Matthew. Let's think, what was the first slide? Everybody hates the tax man. Matthew, as a tax collector in Rome, would have been excluded from the synagogue. They would not want him there. He would not be allowed to come and worship with them. He would have been excommunicated in a more conservative synagogue. He was an outsider, and yet Jesus stops at his money collection table and calls him to be one of the 12 apostles. Why would Jesus do that? And you can imagine that Matthew, coming as an outsider, and viewing the gospel, um, the life of Jesus as an outsider, is interested in the outsiders. And he's interested, I think, in the very thing that you're saying, Amy, in that, and it may be true that he really didn't like these women, and, and, and he may himself have been shocked by it. But these are the Hebrews. When they're shocked by something, they'll write about it. You know, we'll hide it. Um, uh, and so, Matthew begins and ends, and all the way through, he pulls in the outsiders. Let's look at a couple of other outsiders he pulls in. Um, the centurion at the foot of the cross, a Roman who is the one who gets it. Peter has run away. The Roman standing at the foot of the cross, of course, he's armed and not in danger of his life, but says, this, truly, this man is the son of God. Matthew chooses to record that testimony. In the stable, who are the people who come who really get what Jesus is about? The shepherds and the wise men. People who would not have been even gotten the time of day from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The shepherds, one of the lowliest people there are, uneducated, unable to read, unable to do anything but just herd sheep. They get a visit from the angels. And the wise men, the magi, who were foreigners who were probably like Zoroastrians or something, and they believed in astrology and, and followed this star and came to Jesus and got who he was. So these outsiders who get who Jesus is, this is a big element in Matthew. Um, I wanted to tell you a couple of things about how Matthew writes. Um, and, and this outsider business, um, Mary then becomes the ultimate outsider. We who revere Mary do not understand how Mary was viewed in her day. She was viewed as an unwed mother. And there was a very strong tradition during uh, the next decades after Jesus died that Mary was raped by a Roman soldier. And that was how Jesus came to be. Or that Mary had some kind of clandestine relationship with somebody. And that was how Jesus came to be. There were lies and, and calumnies spread about Mary. As you know, Satan would inspire. Um, the, the followers of Jesus revered her. But in general, over the course of her life, this hung over her head. So Mary was an outsider. And Matthew records the Annunciation and her experience um, and the, the fact that she, throughout Jesus' life, understands him in a way um, that she, only an outsider can understand another outsider. So not only Jesus descended below all things to be born, in a way his mother descended in, below all things in order to have him. She lost her reputation as a virtuous woman undeservedly, just as Jesus was considered to be evil when he wasn't. And so in this way, he was raised by someone who understood the pain of being an outsider. I was listening to a, a Christian preacher the other day, and he said, can you imagine the bedtime stories that Jesus heard at his mother's knee? Tell me again, Mom, about the time that the wise men came. Tell me again about what it was like when I was born. Um, the experiences that she had leading up to his birth, she knew who he was. And we know in the Gospel of John, um, when she sets up the first miracle, um, I love the, the, the cryptic way it's just presented. You know, she comes in and she says, they're out of wine. And he says, woman, it's not my time. 
and they're out of wine. This is his mother setting him on his path, as this good brother had said um, to us at the end of our class last time. Um, these great mothers with vision put their sons in a position to um, go forward and do great things. Two talks that I'm using today and that I've been really inspired by are, are connected with that. One is by David Bednar called The Hearts of the Children Shall Turn, and the other is by Jeffrey Holland called Tomorrow the Lord Will Do Wonders Among You. And I did this week go in and update our um, class website so that a lot of these sources will be in there. I'm going to try to stay ahead of it now. So at the beginning, when, when um, the angels talk about who Jesus is, they say, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And then if we go all the way to the end of Matthew, if you just want to flip to the very end of the book, uh, Matthew 28. These little pages are so thin. Um, at the very end of Matthew, Matthew 28, the very end. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even till the end of the world. So by interpretation, his name means I'm with you and he's with you. So we're going to talk a little bit about how he's with us. So he's with all of us. So this outsider, this business of the outsider, um, everybody hates the tax man. We talked about that. We've talked about the other women and the other testimonies of Jesus. Also, Matthew um, is written in Hebrew, but all of the quotations that he does from the scriptures when he says this was this and this was this, there's over 50 quotations in Matthew, and, he, and they're all written in Greek. And it is because he, he's using the Septuagint was the Greek version of the Torah. It was the Greek translation of the Torah. And he is using that because he is hoping that a wider audience is going to be reading these words. And so the wider audience are the Greeks, the Romans, the people around who read Greek. And so he puts his quotes in Greek. All the way, he is, yes, referring to the Jewish scriptures, but he's referring to them in such a way that it can go out. So with that as a little bit of background, let's talk about this little concept right here. Who would Jesus invite to church? Who would Jesus invite to the banquet? Um, Matthew invites people into his gospel that we might not have invited, starting with these four very questionable women who all were put in situations that were very difficult for them and um, figured it out one way or another, maybe not the way that would end up in the standards of the youth pamphlet, but <laughs> Jesus, who said to the Pharisees, harlots will go into the kingdom of heaven before you, these are the people he was talking about. People who were put in impossible situations and figured it out one way or another, but their hearts were, were moving toward the right thing. They were trying to do the right thing in their lives. Here's a cute little article that Carla Anderson shared with us that I think just talking about uh, who would Jesus have invited, by who Matthew invites into the gospel we might think who Jesus would invite into the circle. Uh, the, this article is called Tattoos and Other Things We Could Use More Of at Church. When I served my mission back in the early days of the Restoration, says this man, we would talk quite a bit about finding the golden contact. You remember that? The golden contact was a phrase we used. That person that you bump into who already wears white shirts and ties, never drinks or smokes, gives generous offerings at his current church, and has six kids who are just an apricot tree away from popping popcorn in the front row of primary. In other words, I was willing and ready to call the righteous to repentance. I didn't want to be saddled with the investigator who's struggling to beat a nicotine addiction, won't marry her live-in boyfriend, or bowls on Sundays. I don't want those people. There's no need to clutter up sacrament meeting with people that are just going to spend hours in the bishop's office. <laughs> As I've gotten much older, I now have realized that there are a lot of things we need more of not less of in sacrament meeting, and that the idea of packing the chapel with 200 people waiting with angelic patients just to be translated probably is misguided and unrealistic. 
Perhaps the Savior would handpick a far different crowd than we would, and I expect he wouldn't so much as blink at the things that give some of us apoplexy. Tattoos, for instance. We need way more tattoos in church. I know that for most of us, the thing we think of when we see someone with sleeves of ink is, wouldn't he make a fine elders quorum president? But why don't we think that? I'm pretty sure that if there was an ink artist in Zarahemla, Alma the Younger would have been tatted up pretty well. <laughs> really? Can you see him? Sons of Mosiah, sleeves, right? And he didn't turn out so bad. The gospel is transformative. Our focus is less on what happened yesterday and more on what we can become today. And tattoos don't equate with evil anyway. That's more about culture than commandment. A friend with a visible tattoo asked our bishop at the time she was baptized if she should have that quite visible tattoo removed. He asked her why. She said, well, some of the Relief Society sisters are bothered by it. His wise counsel was, let them be bothered. It doesn't say anything about who you are now. I couldn't agree more. Let's not look down our noses at tattoos just because the lingering signs of our own lapses in judgment are less visible. A story I quoted in my book by Dan Clark was um, when he and his companion in Ireland went to visit a lady and when she opened the door without even looking at their name tags, she said, oh, elders, come in. Well, in Ireland, that was strange at that time. And they had a conversation, and she said she had joined the church many years before, loved the gospel. And um, they said, well, why don't you go now? And she said, well, I never could get over my smoking habit, and, and I, I smell like smoke. And the lady, people wouldn't sit next to me, and I could tell that it bothered people, so I stopped going. And she stopped for a minute, and tears came down her cheeks, and she said, I, I wish other people's sins smelled like mine. Andy says, we need more people of color. No, that's too generic. We don't need more Hispanic and Asian people. There's a lot of those. And you can't throw a rock in the church without hitting a Tongan. <laughs> he says, and when you do, he will smile at you like he didn't feel a thing. Don't you just love those people? He says, no, what we need more in the US congregations is real black people. This isn't a diversity thing. It's a failure to spread the gospel thing. It's a failure to open the culture thing. He said, I know that missionary work among African Americans can be challenging, but most of that is due to cultural differences and making absolutely sure that everybody who walks through our door is welcome. And bring on the gays. We need more LGBT in LDS, he says. <laughs> I can't even say that. He says, now this is a difficult sell for the church because of our position on gay marriage and much of the LGBT community resents what they believe to be our mixed messages at best. But that isn't everyone. And my experience is that there are more than a few LGBT folks that feel a great affinity for the church and would like to participate in a more meaningful way. Yet I still hear members make comments like, well, why would a gay person want to be a Mormon? I don't know, but maybe for the same reason that a self-righteous snoot would want to be a Mormon. <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> he says, we don't get to decide who belongs in God's kingdom. God does. And we've been told clearly that sexual orientation does not exclude anyone from the blessings of the church. Um, when I first started, uh, when we first moved here, I was getting my hair done by a a man who was gay, as many of us do, because there are many gay men who do your hair. And, he, and uh, he mentioned to me, as we were getting to know each other, that he was raised a devout Catholic, but he had ended up with a partner um, who was a returned Mormon missionary. And uh, they were getting married. And I said, you know, I want to applaud you for doing just what I taught my daughters to do, and that is marry a return missionary. <laughs> It's the best chance for success in marriage. <laughs> I really have always thought that was a good answer right that minute. Um, later, um, he read, when, the, when we all contributed to the propositions that opposed gay marriage and our names were posted, he read our name because our stake president had come and told us to give money and we gave money because you know, we're in the church, we give money where we're told. And this was devastating to him. But we talked about it and we talked it through. We're still friends. It's more to their credit than mine that we are still friends. Um, there are many, many people 
who are in same-sex relationships, who have morals and a desire to be monogamous and, and righteous in their lives. Um, and we have much to share and give them. He says, there are many other things I would welcome more of in sacrament meetings. We need more of the smell of tobacco. We need some track marks. We need breath that carries a hint of alcohol and mustaches, many more mustaches. <laughs> Most of all, he says, what I think we can use more of is compassion, tolerance, and Christ-like love. His ministry was all about people on the fringes. So we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit of just push ourselves out of our comfort zone. This is the same guy. If you dress him in his doctor's outfit, he looks like a lovely member of the high priest group. On Saturdays, he looks like those people we meet at the, um, where do we go? Oh, we go to the Lake Henshaw Cafe. So having said all of that, and you know, we all hear this a lot, and yeah, we're not supposed to be more accepting and all those kind of things, but, but there's a whole other side to it, and that is, you know, at the same time, we have children and grandchildren we're trying to protect, and there's all this kind of stuff. What can you do to follow the injunction of Jesus to welcome the outsider more? Like, what can we do that we're not doing? Is there anything that you've thought of or any experiences that you've had that have, you've felt like you got your circle opened a little bit more? Um, talk to me, because we need to share wisdom on this. I mean, this, we don't want to just go around feeling mildly guilty. Yes, stand up. No, it's all right, you won't now, because we're busy fixing the slides. I'm surrounded in my family by people who either left the church or taken on a different um, to begin lifestyle. The only thing you can do is love them. You just have to love. And um, as far as I don't want my children to go the same way, you know, as you were saying, you, you know, yeah, you're, you've got you've got these two things you're doing, yeah. So you have to kind of because we're not supposed to judge. You have to love and you have to. Still be strong in what you believe, mm -hmm. right or wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to open your heart and love them. And I mean, my brother, he didn't get a tattoo until he was 50. Now there's something kind of strange about that. But anyway, he's a preacher. And he felt, I think, to get a cross on his arm and, and do those things was to relate to the people he's communicating with. I got kind of excited the other day when I read that Judy Dench got a tattoo when she turned 80 that said Carpe Diem. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking, I'm going to be 65 this year, I'm kind of thinking about an angel Moroni somewhere. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just thinking about it. I'm just saying. I'm just going to give it some thought. And you can wonder about that. <laughs> yeah, just don't put it where we have to see it, Marilyn. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, there, I think, I don't have a great answer for this. I really don't have a great answer for this question. I think the gospel is full of paradox like that, where Jesus asks you to do one thing and he asks you to do the other, where he says, he that loses his life shall save it. I had a conversation this morning with Lorraine Hibbert, who's about to go on her mission, and she's had a son be completely gone, 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 out of the church for 20 years, so that she's just loved him and tried to, you know, and, and there was a lady at his work who just assumed that he was, uh, when she knew he was Latter-day Saint, she just assumed he was an active Latter-day Saint. And so she would always come to him and say, you know, I've got to leave Tuesday afternoon because lady I visit teaches in the hospital. So you understand that, right? And, you know, and she brings him little muffins and she, you know, she does all the LDS things that she's perfectly comfortable with him because she feels like they're in this, in league together. And, um, he said to his mother, I, I, I didn't want, I kind of wanted to surprise you with this, but you're leaving on your mission. I want you to know I've been to see my bishop. I'm on the path to the temple after 20 years. He's in his 50s. And she said, what is it about? And he goes, I don't know. There was just something about that lady. She just drew me in. And, and he said, it just made me remember how great it was to be part of that circle. And um, so I think, like so many things in the gospel, we don't know how to do it if God doesn't teach us. If Jesus doesn't teach us how to do it, we're going to do it wrong. And that's why he, um, he shines a light on those kinds of things. So that's about the best answer I can give on that. 
as you read the book of Matthew, I just want you to notice, um, I'll stick this slide in the, in, the, um, in the lesson website, but it's organized into five, like the Pentateuch. Um, it's organized into five, around five great discourses of Jesus. And he is very aware that Jews will notice this and, and will pick up the fact that it's done in a group of five. And um, these great five discourses of Jesus give us some of these answers that we're looking for. Well, let's talk about our own Mount of Transfiguration. We read about Jesus going up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And um, what do you have, I mean, am I, am I just out there? Do you have anything that you might share with us that you would feel like would be comparable in our lives to an experience like the Mount of Transfiguration? How can we be like Jesus? What, what is this here for? What is he trying to tell us in this, in this passage? Anybody have anything that you felt like was a Mount of Transfiguration in your life that, that you felt like, okay, boom, I get it now. I had, I had this vision and now I have this vision. Or do you have anything in your life that works that way? Yes, thank you. I've been thinking briefly along the lines of having a change of heart, which can be a personal amount of transfiguration. Exactly. And I have often thought in my own life, I wish you know the people around me that I love would have that great, you know, out of the other change of heart. And um, and how how can we earn such a transformation of soul and purpose in our life? And as I pondered this, I often thought that we all do have this in our life, whether it's the moment that we realize that we have a testimony or the moment our testimony is tested and we have to stand up for it. And part of maintaining that change of heart that we've experienced one time is doing the small things of the gospel, reading the scriptures, attending church. And so I, I think we all do have that moment in our life and we need to keep it alive in our hearts by doing the smaller things that, that result from that moment. I love what you've shared because I do think that we have, we have those moments when light gets shed on who we are and what we're doing. There's a story I love, um, and we're going to play a video now in a second here, Karen, so I'm not even going to let you relax. Um, there's a story I love and have always loved. I found it when I first read uh, the book called Gospel Doctrine, which is written by Joseph F. Smith. Remember the F, the guy in the middle. Not Joseph Smith and not Joseph Fielding Smith, but the guy in the middle that died uh, in 1918, just as the war was ending of the Spanish influenza. So he's right there in World War I time. He was Mary Fielding Smith's son. Um, no, I got that wrong. That's the wrong guy. Couldn't have died during World War I time. Joseph F. Smith is earlier. He's Mary Fielding Smith's son. He's Hiram Smith's son. And he, at nine, he's the famous kid who walks across the plains with his mother and she blesses the oxen, right? So at 15 years old, he has nobody left because they get to Salt Lake Valley and Mary Fielding Smith only lives about four more years and then she dies. And so he's essentially just all by himself. He's 15 years old. So what do they do with him? They send him on a mission to Hawaii. And in Hawaii, this would be, uh, this is a, a dwelling that he would have lived in. This is very much like his place where he would have lived. At the end of the book Gospel Doctrine, in little tiny print at the end, for some reason it's just in the back, I found this, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, I found this vision that he records. And Gordon B. Hinckley told it a couple of times during his life, and he tells it so beautifully. We're going to ask President Hinckley to tell it to us now. This was Joseph F. Smith's moment of transfiguration. Um, and we'll just, we'll just go ahead and let, now, if you go down and you hit that, that should work, okay? Love it. Thank you. Joseph F. Smith was the son of Hiram Smith, who was the brother of the prophet Joseph and was martyred with him in Carthage. Joseph F. was born at Far West, Missouri on November 13, 1838. He came out of Missouri as an infant. As a lad not yet six years of age, he heard a knock on the window of his mother's home in Nauvoo. It was a man who had hurriedly written from Carthage and who told Sister Smith that her husband had been killed that afternoon. When he was nine, 
he drove an ox team with his mother across the plains to this valley. At the age of 15, he was called on a mission to Hawaii. He made his way to San Francisco and there worked in a shingle mill to earn enough money to buy passage to the islands. Hawaii was not a tourist center then. It was populated by the native Hawaiians, who were for the most part poor, but generous with what they had. He learned to speak their language and to love them. While serving there, he experienced a remarkable dream. I quote from his narrative concerning this. Said he, I was very much oppressed when I was on a mission. I was almost naked and entirely friendless, except for the friendship of a poor, benighted people. I felt as if I was so debased in my condition of poverty, lack of intelligence and knowledge, just a boy, that I hardly dared look a man in the face. While in that condition, I dreamed one night that I was on a journey, and I was impressed that I ought to hurry, hurry with all my might, for fear I might be too late. I rushed on my way as fast as I possibly could, and I was only conscious of having just a little bundle, a handkerchief with a small bundle wrapped in it. I did not realize what it was when I was hurrying as fast as I could. But finally I came to a wonderful mansion. I thought I knew that was my destination. As I passed towards it as fast as I could, I saw a notice which read, B-A-T-H, Bath. I turned aside quickly and went into the side of the bath and washed myself clean. I opened up this little bundle that I had, and there was a pair of white, clean clothing, a thing I had not seen for a long time because the people I was with did not think very much of making things exceedingly clean. But my clothing was clean, and I put it on. Then I rushed what appeared to be a great opening or door. I knocked, and the door opened, and the man who stood there was the prophet Joseph Smith. He looked at me a little reprovingly, and the first words he said, Joseph, you are late. Yet I took confidence and replied, Yes, but I am clean. I am clean. He clasped my hand and drew me in, then closed the great door. I felt his hand just as tangible as I ever felt the hand of man. I knew him, and when I entered, I saw my father, and Brigham Young, and Heber C. Kimball, and Willard Richards, and other good men that I had known standing in a row. I looked as if it were across this valley, and it seemed to be filled with a vast multitude of people but on the stage were all the people that I had known. My mother was there, and she sat with a child in her lap, and I could name over as many as I remember of their names who sat there, who seemed to be among the chosen, among the exalted. When I had this dream, I was alone on a mat, away up in the mountains of Hawaii, no one was with me, but in this vision, I pressed my hand up against the prophet, and I saw a smile cross his countenance. 
When I awoke that morning, I was a man, although only still a boy. There was not anything in the world that I feared after that. I could meet any man or child and look them in the face, feeling in my soul that I was a man every whit. That vision, that manifestation and witness that I enjoyed at that time has made me what I am. If I am anything that is good or clean or upright before the Lord, if there is anything good in me, that has helped me out in every trial and through every difficulty. So our Mount of Transfiguration moment that for Joseph F. Smith, a 15-year-old boy, oh, how we would pray that every one of our children could have a moment like that. But notice that that moment like that came to him in his privation. Um, it did not come to him as we were shielding, as he was being shielded from all of the difficult things in his life. But it came to him as he faced difficult things and did hard things. Um, as I was... I uh, went to sleep last night thinking about this. I woke up this morning, as I often do early on the day I give a lesson, and I thought, well, what was my Mount of Transfiguration moment? And you have different ones, don't you, for different things in your life. You have maybe about your testimony. You have different things about different experiences in your life. One thing that I would like to just mention today is to challenge you to think about a relationship in your life that has some darkness in it. A relationship in your life that maybe right now is just difficult, uh, that's a little bit teeth gritting. Um, and see if we could have a mound of transfiguration moment about that. Dieter Uchtdorf has this beautiful quote where he says to us that every time you do something where you go outside of yourself, um, you shine a little of that light on your life. And I certainly, when I woke up this morning and was thinking about my own life, and I said, well, what is my Mount of Transfiguration moment? And I felt the Spirit say in my heart, you know exactly when it was, Marilyn. You just don't want to talk about it. And in my own particular relationship, in my marriage relationship, there was definitely a Mount of Transfiguration moment for me. Uh, I have always liked the, the, the saying where a therapist said that a couple came to him and said, he said, how long have you been married? And the wife said, we've been married 51 years. And the husband said, no. We've been married one year, 51 times. And when you think about that, that can be very telling, can't it? That we can begin doing things in our relationships with our husbands, with our wives, with our children, where we just do the same thing over and over that doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, we do a little more of it. For example, we complain and say that we don't get enough attention or enough affection. And then if we feel we don't get enough, we complain more about that. And for some reason, that doesn't seem to work, does it? And we hit at about 10 years in our marriage. Uh, I think what just about everybody hits about 10 years in a marriage. You just do the math. You know, four kids in six years, a career, a home, a you know, few church, throw in a few church callings, and you're worn down physically, and, and, and you have a combination that can come together of a pretty teeth gritting time. And I, it just seemed that more and more and more, I could just think of so many things that I wasn't getting in that relationship, and that how much I was giving. I mean, you can imagine what a joy it is to be married to me, you know. Whatever. And, and, but that, you know, you kind of can get in that mode, can't you? We were sitting uh, in a restaurant the other night, and, the, and at the table next to us were two women complaining about their husbands back and forth. Well, I do this, but he never does that. I do this, but he never does that. And, and we just started listening, and pretty soon Craig smiled and said, well, the lawyer's next. We'll be calling the lawyer next. Because once you get into that frame of mind, any relationship will begin to unravel. Well, we had a conversation one night um, that was a turning point in my life. Uh, and for some reason, and I, and I say, we have never been to a marriage counselor, but I say, but I, I praise God that the Holy Ghost has been the best marriage counselor we could have ever had. Because for me, anyway, at that time, as exhausted as I felt emotionally, and I think I know that my husband felt the same way, um, 
it came into my mind to ask him what it was like to be married to me. And, you know, it's like asking me, asking a husband, do I look good in this dress? You know, it's a trick question. There's only one answer, you know. <laughs> and he looked at me with that, that wary look that husbands get after a few years. They know when a dangerous question is coming and, they, and they're just going to try to negotiate this, this bed of coals that they've got to walk across. And he looked at me, but, you know, the question didn't come from me. It came from the spirit. And I really wanted to know. And for a minute after he looked at me, he realized I really wanted to know. And we proceeded to have a conversation that was one of the most enlightening of my life, where my good husband talked to me what it was about what it was like to be married to me. And in a lot of ways, it was great. And in a lot of ways, it was extremely difficult. And when he realized he had someone to listen to him and not jump in and defend and not say argue with him, he just unburdened himself. He's not a person like most men are. They're not going to go talk to somebody else about things. And if they can't talk to you, then they just stop talking. And you wonder why they stopped talking, huh? And as he unburdened himself and, you know, talked about, you know, gee, it's, it's great to be married to you, but you'll get all sad because you don't get enough affection. And so then I try a lot harder to give you a lot of affection. And then a few weeks later, you tell me how you're not getting enough affection. And I think, shoot, I was trying really hard. So then I think, well, why try? And these kinds of things as they came out, all of a sudden, it seemed to me as I was listening that it wouldn't be that hard to make a few little changes that would make it so much easier. It just seemed to me that I'd gotten into a few patterns of thinking that were all wrapped up in myself, that if I just sort of climbed out of them just a little bit, it could just be so much easier. And I really think that the one thing that I've noticed about when Jesus comes into a situation is that it doesn't seem hard to make a change. It doesn't seem so hard. It seems hard when you're trying to do it by yourself. When he helps you make a change, it doesn't seem hard. It feels like someone just turned the light on. And for me, from that time, I heard a man say one time, I've been married 38 years, and I, you know, I'm really sitting, I, I can't even remember what, oh, I know what, I know what the joke is. He says, I've been married, I've had 20 blissful years of marriage, and I think 20 out of 38 is pretty good. I think that's what the joke is, right? And I, from that time in my life, my marriage has been so happy. Before then, it was happy and hard and this and that. From that time on, it hasn't been without problems or without difficulties, but the, the change, there was just a change. It was like the light went on for me. I believe in that kind of thing. I think Satan would like to tell us that we just have to put up with our lives because people can't change. I really believe that Jesus can turn the light on, that he can just turn the light on and help you see something in a way you haven't seen it before. And the biggest thing he'll help you see is yourself and the way others perceive you. And he will make it easier for you to make it easier for other people to hang out with you because it can just be hard. We can just make it hard. We see on the faces of our children and our spouses and our parents that we cause them pain by the way that we act. And if Jesus can flip that light on, we can not make as many of those mistakes. I told Michelle Clifford, I thanked her for what she said last week, that wonderful insight from her mother who said, don't make a, what is it, Michelle? Never make the problem to be solved more important than the person to be loved. That's Jesus turning on the light for her as she's going through her house and thinking about a problem. These little things that can come into our minds can make huge differences in our lives. Because I'll tell you what, when things get tough, it would be extremely painful to have mixed feelings about the person that you are sealed to. It's wonderful to know that your heart is full of love and his heart is full of love. And as my husband will say to me, you should never be mad at me because if I do something that makes you mad, you know I didn't mean to make you mad, so you just shouldn't get mad. <laughs> I think, well, I wish I could do that. But you know, that's kind of wonderful. I mean, you sort of think that at the bottom of your heart. You think this person would never hurt me on purpose. So if he doesn't communicate to me or, or, or act toward me in the way that I would think would be ideal, I know his heart. I saw his heart when Jesus turned on the light. And that heart is what I know. 
I testify that our moments of transfiguration can be many in life. We can have one for every relationship. We can have one for our temple attendance. We can have one for our church callings. We can have one for our own physical bodies. I even yesterday was thinking about my poor old physical body, which I've been having a big kind of a struggle with. And I thought, I wonder what it's like to be my body and get, get ragged on all the time like I do. I'm always so insulting about it, you know? And so I've decided that instead of talking about my body the way I've been talking about it, I'm going to talk about it as my queenly frame. <laughs> And it's growing more queenly, but whatever. And I'm just going to try to shine the light on it and, and, and not be negative and not let darkness even into my relationship with myself. May God bless us to have a moment of transfiguration for ourselves. I really believe that as Jesus shines the light on our lives, even in small things, we can make changes that can measurably increase our happiness. And I bear testimony of that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Next week we won't have class. I'm thankful for all of you. And um, I hope that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving with your families. Um, I did want to tell you that we have um, uh, raised almost $500 from you guys buying books. Thank you very much. And so we have enough money that our class, I thought it might be fun if we were a sponsor at the Holiday Basket Drive, you know, Sisters in Scriptures, so that we could invite people to come to our class. So thank you very much for that. I have a few books out there uh, left, and um, there was something else I was going to tell you, but I can't remember. Maybe I wrote it on the board. But anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>